Well, if by chance you uh, are doing what I did my last year, I split my last year of school into uh, two as I had the privilege of taking a church outside of Dallas. I took my last year and I came in two days a week, so I didn't make chapel every day. And we're talking about true spirituality. I mean, what's it really mean to walk with God? And in uh, day number one, we talked about answering that big question of what does God really want? And He wants you. A living sacrifice. Day number two, we talked about the process of uh, how do you keep your heart where God wants it and how do you get the very best from God? And we learned in verse two of chapter 12 that we need to say no to the world, yes to God, renew our mind to experience what we just sang. Experience is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. To me, those answer two big questions. How do you give God what he wants the most? And how do you get the very best from God? I want to talk now about the third question. I think we sort of gloss over. How do you come to grips with the real you? Uh, psychologists and theologians all agree that human beings, consciously or unconsciously, from early childhood to the day you die, are seeking to answer three basic questions. The first question is, who am I? It's an identity question. And so we tell people when you're early, who am I? I'm an Ingram. You tell them what family you're from. Later, who am I? You might tell them your profession. I'm a, I'm a scientist. I'm a construction worker. I'm a software engineer. I'm a professor at Dallas Seminary. I'm a pastor. Um, later, we might describe ourselves by our passions. So who are you? I'm a surfer. I'm an artist. I'm a musician. I'm a mom. But you're always asking that question. It's formulating in your heart and in your mind, and it grows. The second question is about identity, uh, moves on to security. Where do I belong? And so from the time we have our kids very small, we put them on little teams, and there's clubs, and there's cliques. Uh, sometimes we identify ourselves by our nationality. I belong to this country, or our ethnicity, or our part of the country. I'm from the South, or I'm from California. Uh, we, we have some people that then we dress in certain ways so people know where we belong. Uh, we like certain teams, so if you go to a, a big stadium, if you have certain colors on, you're a cowboy fan. If you have other, you're a redskin fan. And so we do all kind of things throughout your whole life uh, to say, this is where I belong. The third thing we ask and answer is, what am I supposed to do? And this is about significance. Why am I on the planet? What's my purpose? And I like to share after being a pastor for 30 years and being in places around the world where people have nothing and being in places where people have millions and millions of dollars, that most of us spend the great majority of our lives trying to be somebody else or wishing we were someone else. And so we dress the way someone else dresses. We want to look the way someone else looks. We want to preach the way someone else preaches. We want to have what someone else has to say that I'm a somebody and I really belong and what I'm doing really matters. And uh, I'd like to ask you to turn in your notes to page number two because if you feel like Discovering who you really are is hard. I want to talk about why it's so hard. And I'm just going to take a, a little side trip before we get back into Romans chapter 12. Because I think if we don't do this, you won't get this. We pick up the story after the coup. Uh, the theologians up here call it the fall. And God is now going to meet with uh, our first parents in the garden after sin. Beginning at verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And when the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? This is obviously not an informational question. It's a diagnostic question. This is a question to help Adam understand what's going on with him, not for God to understand where he is. His answer, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid, circle the word afraid. Because I was naked, circle the word naked. So I hid myself, circle the word hid. You're going to find in just a second that those three words defined your relational pattern and my relational pattern with God and with one another. And it shapes everything about answering those questions. So God asked a follow-up question. He said, well, who told you that you're naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, this is that first marital moment when Eve is standing next to her man in this previously perfect world and knows that no matter what happens, he'll be there for you. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So Adam, being the brave, courageous, godly, protective, assertive husband, says, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. In other words, it's not my fault. See, he's hiding and he's blame shifting. And so God sort of, in the great work of a counselor, says, well, let's find out how Eve is processing their sin. And so the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? She's a very quick study. After observing her husband's behavior, she goes, he's right, it wasn't his fault, me neither. And she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, the inference here you got to get is, he's speaking to God. It's the woman. And by the way, you know, by way of inference, now, who brought her into this equation anyway? The woman gets it. Oh, it's the serpent. And by the way, like, who created this crazy serpent anyway? See, ultimately, when we hide and when we're afraid and when we blame, we really say the problem is God's fault. Uh, three obstacles to getting the right answer, and I'm going to suggest, having taught this in a lot of different cultures, that the first two verses of Romans 12 really talk about loving God. After this section, verses 9 through the end of the chapter, talk about loving people. 9 through 13, we'll learn is about what it looks like to love believers, 14 to 21. It's how do you love unbelievers or people that are opposed to you. And sandwiched in between loving God and loving people is you need to learn to love yourself and you can't love you if you're hiding and in denial about who you really are. Coming to grips with the real you is transformational. Obstacles are number one, fear rooted in shame. That's what sin does. I was afraid. We all secretly fear that people will see us for who we really are that they strip away our degrees, strip away how we look, strip away our performance, and they'll see the lust and the envy and the private thoughts and where our image management doesn't cover up and see down deep, we're afraid that people will see who we really are and they'll reject that person. And so we do what I call sort of personality and spiritual holograms. We've learned from early childhood how to project this and project that, often projecting different things to different groups so that we get accepted. And the tragedy is they accept the hologram, but you know that's not really you, so you don't experience real love. You don't really experience real love until someone looks you in the eye and sees the good, the bad, and the ugly and says, yeah, I see it all, and I love you for who you are, not based on your performance. The second obstacle is hiding rooted in insecurity. He's insecure. I mean, Adam, for the first time in his life, and I don't understand, and I don't think anybody really does, but how he was covered and what naked was like. But for the first time in his life, he's aware that there's, there's unseemly parts of him. There's parts of him that he wants to cover that he doesn't measure up. And I want to suggest to you that every single person on the face of the earth after the fall is desperately insecure. However cool, however confident, however put together anyone may ever appear, we are all desperately insecure. The third is blaming rooted in denial. The woman says, it's the serpent. The man says, it's the woman. Uh, I uh, found myself at 28 years old in my first pastorate out 32 miles southeast of Dallas, Country Bible Church, Kaufman, Texas. At the time, no stoplights. You've heard of mega churches. This is a mini church, 35 people. And I thought it was a rural church because I went there and I interviewed and people had pickup trucks and guns in the back of pickup trucks. And I mean, I'm, I'm a city boy. I grew up in the suburbs of Columbus, Ohio, and boys were walking around and they had a circle in their jeans and I thought it was a fashion statement. And, and instead of drinking out of Coke cans, they were spitting in Coke cans. I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And I thought, God, where are you taking me? And yet you know, people had John Deere hats and so this rural community, I'm going to be a pastor, and I figure, you know, they asked me for a five-year commitment, and I had a year of school left, and I thought, I'm going to have to learn to be a pastor someday, so I might as well start here. And I was broke, and I was tired, and I had three kids. And those were other factors that God used to say, what a great opportunity. <laughs> and, um, and so pretty soon what I found out was this wasn't a group of rural people. Uh, I went to one guy's home, and my introduction to Southern Living was on the coffee table. I didn't know what that was. And 
you know, they were going to be out of town because they were going to go skiing in Vail. And, and pretty soon, one of the other leaders told me, uh, why don't you meet me downtown at the CPA firm that I own? And the other guy says, well, uh, I've got to be in Austin. I own a series of apartments, but why don't we meet at my Honda dealership? And pretty soon what I found out, there's only 35 people, and there were eight leaders. And of the eight leaders, seven of them were extremely affluent. And what they really wanted to do was figure out how to have an impact but not drive 30 miles into Dallas to come to all the great Bible churches. And so let's get some young seminary student. And I learned later that I was like the ninth of students they had. And the first eight didn't work out, but they didn't tell me about those. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about you, but have you ever been intimidated to death? My dad was uh, out of the Depression. My dad was World War II, Guam, Iwo Jima, uh, Purple Heart. Uh, I went to the bank as a little boy every day on Saturday, and you had a bank book and you saved money. Every night I watched my dad walk around our house multiple times and check the locks multiple times. So I grew up uh, where all three of us kids, a two-bedroom house that was, you know, rented, and all three of us in one room, and and my parents in the other, and as they were both school teachers, as we, you know, we went to the little ranch house and we made our progress. But I grew up with this sense that rich people are intimidating. They know more than you, they're really smart, and be very frugal. And I, I remember my first weekend there, and th this is so, I mean, embarrassing. I didn't sleep for six days. I went over my sermon like 5,000. This is to speak before 35 people. 15 minutes outside of the great metropolitan area. I mean, this little white thing was out in the country, out 15 minutes outside of downtown Kaufman. And I couldn't sleep and sleep, and I was so uptight. And my first year and a half there was just like, I just pens and needles. I worked like 80 hours a week trying to hit the phone ring, meet everybody's needs. And then I read a book. And it's out of print. In fact, I, I looked it on Amazon, and it, there's only seven new copies. It cost $125 for this book because it's out of print. It's called The Strong and the Weak by Paul Turnier, Swiss Christian psychologist. Uh, you can get a used copy for 11 bucks. I read that 28 years ago. You don't have to read it. I'm going to give you the whole book. Thesis of the book, everyone, because of the fall, is desperately insecure. There are two reactions to insecurity, strong reactions and weak reactions. People that are desperately insecure that have weak reactions, they're shy, they're withdrawn, they look at their feet, I don't measure up, God can never use me, um, I feel intimidated by other people, I shut down when things get threatening, I don't take risks, because they're insecure. Insecure people with strong reactions, they walk into the room and go, well, you know, George Bush and Flora are doing pretty well, you know, we had lunch with them and... Uh, my G5 was out of gas, and we couldn't get to the Bahamas in time for a good vacation, so we did what we could. And um, by the way, I've got 4,574 people reporting to me, but I sold that other company. And, and by the way, you know, uh, you know, I did that Bible study. President Dallas Seminary leads it because he meets with me and a handful of people. And, uh, you know, gosh, you know, these Armani suits, uh, I just, I don't know, they just don't fit the way they ought to. Of course, you know, my personal tailor said he would fix that. And you've all been around people that power up or intimidate and they tell you about what they have and where they've been and who they know. Let me tell you something. Here's what, here's what I learned, the most aha moment that changed my world. What I learned is when people do that, they're just screaming, I'm desperately insecure. Because see, when people look at their feet and they're shy and they withdraw, you know what they're doing? They want to create distance. They're creating distance so you don't see who they really are because they think you'll reject them if they ever saw the real you. And people that power up with these strong things, guess what they do? They create distance. Because they're desperately afraid of the little boy or little girl inside that if you knew down deep behind all their stuff and all their accomplishments, if you saw them, you would reject them. And so I was having breakfast, and this one guy always demanded that he pay for the breakfast and wanted to make me sort of the dependent little servant boy pastor. And so I got there early, and I made sure I paid in advance. And Oh, uh, no, no, you can't do it. His reaction, I said, look. And then and I started helping their kids, and then I realized, boy, how dysfunctional some of the families were. And all of a sudden, you know what? I just realized, these rich people are as messed up as me. They're as afraid of life as me. They have bigger problems because of their money and their background than me. And I remember realizing a turning point in my life. I just thought, well, if everyone's desperately insecure, let's just own it. And I just, I remember I started with that guy. He's now a friend of over 30 years. 
But I remember I said to him, I said, you know something? If you want to manipulate our relationship and power up on me, because what I've watched you do in your family, because I'm counseling your kids now, and the tension that you have in your marriage, and how you operate with other people, if you want to hide behind that and pay for everything, so I'm the dependent person, you can. Now, you got more money. If we go to a country club, you pay. We go to a big steak dinner, you pay. But this is the diner in Kaufman, Texas, I bought. And we're either going to be friends and peers, or I'm not doing this deal. So what do you want to do? And I'll tell you what, it was like God built and formed a relationship that we, we learned to love one another. And the guy's been like a dad to me since. Had breakfast with him this morning. Can I tell you that you got to come to grips with the real you? And I don't care how smart or how many degrees or how much money or how big your church or how successful or what your parents did. You can hide behind your degrees. You can hide behind your looks. You can hide behind your musical, artistic, athletic. It goes on and on and on and on. And you'll spend your whole life playing one big game. What you need to do is figure out who God made you to be and realize in a fallen world, there's part of that is so precious and wonderful and dignified. And in a fallen world, there's junk in you that is so ugly and so despicable. And your best efforts at righteousness are like filthy rags. And God sees and looks at both. And because of the blood of Christ, he says, I love you. There's nothing to prove. I love you. You start to minister out of being a whole person who's loved just for who you are. Your world changes. Your relationships change. You don't have to impress people. You don't always have to get an A. You don't ha always have to be the best. You can do exactly what God wants you to do. Well, how do you get there? I want to suggest that Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, very interestingly, answers the questions of who am I, where do I belong, and what are you supposed to do? And can I pause for, I think the big word here is pedagogy for just a minute? Here's what I want you to understand, because in the brown bag, people were asking me about packaging material and how do you package material. I did not think of these three questions, try and find Romans chapter 12 and figure out, because they're really three good questions, how to fit this passage into those three questions. I spent a lot of time exegeting Romans 12, looking at every relationship, doing all the grammar, outlining it, and then asking myself if these are the answers about being surrendered to God, being separate from the world's values, and this is all about having a sober self-assessment, and the 9 through 13 is how I relate to believers, and then 14 through 21 is about how to supernaturally respond to evil with good. God, what do you want to say, and how do I help people in our day understand this? And it just so happens that as you exegete this passage, it answers the deepest questions then and the deepest questions now. Because after 11 chapters of grace, he wants us to understand what it looks like to love God and love our neighbor as our self. So it doesn't surprise me that the first two verses talk about what God wants loving him is surrender and that there's a arch enemy and a world system to seduce your love away from God and that I need to have a sober self-assessment so I can bring the real authentic me into relationships and love and be deeply loved. And out of that great resource, respond to evil and bless those who persecute me. Do you get it? So let's walk through the text. Who are you? For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with a sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. I want you, if you will, to underline the word think Underline the word ought because this the, is the NIV. The word actually is repeated. They just are trying to make it a little bit smoother here. It's the same, same word as think. The word ought is the word think. That rather think and then sober judgment. All, all four, same root word. The idea is to have an accurate, the sober judgment is, is being the opposite of drunk. In other words, instead of having sort of your, your perception altered by some other influence, he's saying for, by the grace of God, after you say no to the world, you have your mind renewed, you experience the will of God. He says, now by God's grace, I want you to think how you ought to think, and I want you to think to have sober judgment. Now, do you think that there's a message here about thinking? And then there's this kind of tricky little phrase, according to the measure of your faith. You can spend a lot of time there. I think Newell gets it best in his Romans commentary where he says, this is faith in its objective sense, 
It's the standard by which we're to evaluate ourselves. In other words, God wants you at some point in your life to grow to the point where you look in the mirror and actually say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Instead of, if I was only taller, if I was only shorter, if I was only thinner. Not just on the outside, but the inside. That the personality he gave you, the sovereignty that he placed you in this family that produced some really good things and some really hard things. But then he wants you to have a biblical standard that when you look into the mirror of your soul, you would begin to see yourself not as someone who needs to prove yourself to others, but you would see yourself as, I'm loved, I'm forgiven, I'm adopted, I have an inheritance. I've been, I must be precious because I, I, I've been given spiritual gifts. I have purpose. I have a future. There's a home being prepared for me. I have a friend who'll never leave me and forsake me. I have a father who loves me. It's called your identity in Christ. He's saying, you need to understand that you've been made, right? And you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto a good work. And it's by his grace, and you need to have a sober self-assessment. And I will tell you what, it'll free you. And to be able to say, you know something? I don't do these things well. I'm weak at this. I really have a tendency to be critical. Your tendency to be critical is probably you're very discerning in some other areas. But I will tell you, it will free your life when you begin to see yourself through the lens of how God sees you. Then notice the reason. Uh, New American says, just as, if you write the word for, some of you New Testament uh, majors will notice in your Greek text, the word gar opens it up. For just as, or the reason For just as we have one body, speaking of our physical body, with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the other. So first, we're to think accurately about ourselves. That's the fill-in for those that missed it. And then second, he says the reason is you have a role to fulfill. Now, I want you to think of this. The human body has all eyes, hands, this is the analogy, and they're all needed and they all function together. If you're trying to be someone else, if you think you have to do life like someone else, if you're pretending to copy someone else, it would be like the eye trying to imitate the ear, then it wouldn't function in seeing. And what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that once you surrender to God and say, God, I'm all yours, and once you go through the process of saying no to the world that says you have to look like this and act like this and have these things, then he says you need to get accurate, sober self-assessment. You don't think of yourself too high. You don't think of yourself too low. Because, you know, whether you're the person who powers up with the strong, I mean, what do we call those people? I mean, after we say, that was a jerk. (laughs) Don't, Don't we just call them arrogant? Could I suggest that the person that looks at their feet, that is shy, overly shy, that withdraws, that won't participate, is just as arrogant? Isn't pride and arrogance a focus on self? If you're focusing on you because you think you're so wonderful and puffing yourself up, your focus is on you. If you're focusing on because I don't measure up, your focus is on you. What's what's God say in the scripture about pride? It says he opposes it. He opposes it. In the book of James, there's that he's anti against pride, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, what's humility? Humility is an accurate view of yourself. In fact, I like Andrew Murray. He says, humility isn't thinking too high or too low. It's not thinking of yourself at all. It's that Philippians 2, 3, and 4 passage. It's really thinking that other people matter. It's being a servant like Jesus of realizing, God, use me, but it's, it's what's going on out there. But you need to know, what's your role in the body? Uh, When we teach this at the church, I give everyone literally a printed out three by five card in the middle, and on one side it says strengths, on the other side it says weaknesses. And if you ask the average person, list your top three strengths and your top three weaknesses, the average person can come up with 10 weaknesses and they they struggle with one strength. And then there's 10% of the population that will give you their 10 top strengths, I know I've got a weakness, I just, give me time, I'll I'll come up with it later, right? 
Now, if, here's how God has made us. He's given you strengths. And by the way, I, I think we've really blown it in most cultures. We, we usually think of things like IQ makes you better than everybody, right? We measure IQ. Well, now in business, they're measuring EQ. I have this theory. This is chip. This isn't Bible. I have this theory that all of the cues are like this circle, and there's all these little slices of pies. And some people have mechanical IQ, and other people have problem-solving IQ, and the other people have IQ as in intelligence and book smarts, and other people have IQ in terms of relationships, and other people... And you know what? If we measured, if you were on a desert island, as much as I love all these profs, I don't want someone who knows seven languages on a desert island we're trying to get off. <laughs> I, I'm looking for problem-solving IQ, engineering IQ, and you see, God's given you strengths, and you need to know what they are, and there's no false humility. That's the other thing that is killing the church. Well, I could never do that. You know, I run a company of 4,000 people, but I don't think I could be in charge of that little committee for, you know, assimilation in the life of the church. Give me a break. I mean, you're the head of HR, right? So you need to know what your strengths are and say, God gave me these. But these, these holes are your weaknesses. And God, God gives you strengths to give you confidence that you're dignity and you're made special. But he's giving you weaknesses so that the strengths of other people, you need other people, so you're interdependent. I mean, the business people have got this. They understand this. They hire to people's weaknesses. They staff the strengths. They put people in teams. It's what the Bible teaches. You don't have to have it all together. But see, genuine humility is being able to be in a group, in a room, go, I'm really good at these three things. When that comes up, give me the ball. But you know what? When these things come up, let's pass it to someone else. That's what he's saying. You need to have an accurate view of yourself because without that, you can't fulfill the right role. Uh, Self-confession, I was a pastor out in that little church, and when I went to pastor's conferences, you know, after about a year and a half, you know, being the dynamic speaker and leader that I am, I go to these pastor's conferences, and actually, it's, I'm exaggerating, so it's maybe two and a half years, and uh, we had, we're up to like 60 people, not quite twice, but, so how's your church going? Oh, we've doubled in the last couple of years. <laughs> you know, we've doubled. <laughs> I mean, what, what's that about? You got 60 people, you know? <laughs> And it's just the other relatives we got to come. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure we saw five people trust Christ the first couple of years. But, but, but what is that when you go to a pastor? You know what all that is? Fear rooted in shame, hiding rooted in insecurity. And then if it didn't work, well, we don't have enough space, blaming. And you know what? It's, it's a refreshing thing. It's an amazing thing to let go of all the energy that we use to try and convince other people that we're really okay. When the creator of all the universe says, this is how okay you are. Of the six and a half, rough or minus, plus or minus billion people, the only person on this planet that has your DNA is you. The only person built and put in your family, in your birth order, at this time in history, is you. And if I wanted you to do something different, I would give you a different IQ or MQ or EQ, or I would have made you firstborn instead of secondborn. And I want to tell you in my sovereignty, I'm going to use every aspect of anything that's ever happened in your life. I want you to embrace who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and understand that in Christ, you're unconditionally accepted, that I have a tremendous plan for your life. And I want you to offer all that you are to me. And I want you to renew your mind. And I want you to see you the way I see you, because I want you to fit in a place that no one else can fulfill and what other people think is immaterial but you'll never get that unless you come to grips with who you are and so he says the three questions who am I I'm in Christ where do I belong in the body of Christ so what's your role in the body of Christ six through eighty answers the question we have different gifts according to the grace given to us now in this passage I believe these are the motivational gifts personally but notice in this passage, he talks about the gifts. He's not talking about, you know, explanations. What he's going to say is, if you have one of these seven gifts, focus your energy and your time in developing and using it. So if you have the gift of prophecy, let him use it in proportion of his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of the saints, let him do it generously. If it's leadership, 
Let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. I mean, what's he saying? Figure out how God made you align that in the body and he's deposited spiritual gifts in you so that you can understand what role you need to play. And if, you, if you're made to lead, lead. If you're made to serve, serve. If you're made to teach, teach. Align your life and your priorities around 80% of your time going into the things that he made you to do. We all have about 20% of the time that's just a pain. But a lot of character gets built in the pain. It's hard to do. It's a can do. It's a discipline to do. It's a learn to do. So, the practice is discover and deploy your spiritual gift. Now, there's a lot packed into this. As you turn to the last page, here's what I want to remind you. True spirituality, in its essence, is loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. It's not about how much you know. It's not about where you went to school. It's not about how you look. It's not about how many degrees you get. It's not the size of the church or the organization that you go in. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I, I just, let's, let's get it down to the basics. Loving God is give him what he wants most. You, you know that great picture in, of Abraham and Isaac? Did God want Isaac? Did you ever think of that? That's what he asked for. Did he want him? No. He wanted Abraham. But Isaac was the idol. What's yours? What's the Isaac in your life that keeps you from saying to God, I'm all in. I'll be single. I'll go to a small church. I'll do whatever you want me to do. But by the way, if you're made to do that, the joy that you will have and the fruitfulness that you will have will be awesome. We've bought into such an American view of Christianity. Pragmatism, success, and numbers. Buildings, budgets, and bodies. But you know something? You will chase very wrong, disappointing, and dashed dreams if you try to be someone else and fulfill a role that wasn't made for you. After we had had this explosive growth up to 60 people, I have a very interesting wife. She comes off so sweet and so godly. <laughs> and she is. But she is brutal in her honesty. So I came home after, you know, turning this mini church into a multi-mini church of 60 people. <laughs> Being a workaholic, uh, obsessed with pleasing everyone. And she, uh, I, I came in large part to Dallas Seminary because John Hanna uh, taught at, in a conference in West Virginia, I don't know how many years ago, I had never in my life, I mean, I just, I came through the NAVs, and I'd never, in a weekend, he taught through the whole book of 1 John, and I thought it was magic. How could anyone explain a whole book, give the historical background, and when he left, I started going to McDonald's an hour and a half early before work, and I went book by book by book, and I didn't know Bible study methods, and I started charting the books, and I tried to figure out how to do what he did. I thought, that, that, so that's how it's put together. And if you learn that at Dallas Seminary, that's what I want to do. And then later, Prof. Hendricks came. And he spoke, and I thought, I wanted to run through a wall. So if they can motivate you like that and teach you like that, that's where I'm going. <laughs> now, there's a downside to that. So my beloved dear wife, after two years into this multi-mini church, she says, honey, could I make a suggestion? And I knew this is her truth-telling. She said, I'm not quite sure, but I think we have one Howard Hendricks in the world. And I think one's enough. I said, honey, what do you mean? <laughs> I don't know whether to spit or wind my watch. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> Enough said. And I realized that in my deep insecurities, I tried to be a lot of different people. And just the journey over the last 30 years, the most attractive, the most beautiful, the most winsome person on the face of the earth is the uncovered you by the grace of God. You are amazing. You are awesome in God's eyes. 
And what other people, you know what? I, I don't care whatever you do. There will people that think you're wonderful and people, I mean, will hate you. And so three things I don't want you to ever forget. Number one, God uniquely created you. You are eternally valuable. And there's not many places that I can say Psalm 139, you know what's there. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want you to remember, second, God placed you in his family. You are unconditionally accepted, Ephesians 3. Is this like answering the big questions or what? Who am I? I'm eternally valuable. I'm uniquely made by God. Where do I belong? I belong in the supernatural community of the body of Christ that he died for and rose from the dead and has a plan for us. And finally, God gifted you to fulfill his purpose. You are irreplaceably significant. Ephesians 2.10. I want to close just in the last minute that I have here. Uh, this, this chapter became kind of my life message, and, and I, I put it in a book form, but my wife really helped me. And one of the things that we struggled with, she came from an alcoholic family, as did I. And, and you have lots of baggage to unpack. And so for two years, uh, about, I was here a year, and my wife and I were having real marriage struggles. I mean, we weren't yellers or screamers, and she loved God, and I loved God, but she just made me crazy, and I made her crazy. And we didn't know how to resolve conflict. We didn't know how to um, communicate. And so back at that time, uh, both Minnerith and Meyer were here on faculty, and after a class, I went up because he described a family situation, and I thought, how has this person got a video camera in my home? And, and he said, well, why don't you come meet with your wife? And we did. And he said, you know, I know you're a seminary student, and, you know, you're making 900 a month and live in government-subsidized housing, but I'll make you a special deal. My, my, my brother's a great counselor, and we'll give you the student rate of only like $90 an hour. And in about 12 sessions, we can unpack. So this is normal. And so I did it. I remember hiding in the waiting room, just praying that no one from Dallas area would see me as a seminary student who needed counseling. Wonder why. P R I D. Why, why would it be so difficult to admit that I have a need out of where I came from? Well, we spent 12 sessions that were the best money we ever sent, and uh, his, his brother was a fabulous biblical counselor. And uh, inside of this, we talked about, you know, what, what I talked about can be inspiring and motivating, but you better have some tools to change. And so there's a, a, a three by five card, and there were these five, my acceptance, my belonging, my worthiness, my security, and my competence. And, and my wife and I sat on the couch for two years. And before I went to work, uh, she would out loud, my physical appearance and my unchangeable aspects is beautiful in God's sight. He is my designer and maker. And under it, Psalm 139, 13 through 17. And we quoted that out loud together. Belongingness, I'm wanted, appreciated, and loved by God, the most important person in my life. Romans 8, 31 and 32. And there, there's five of these cards. And then there was others that, for our relationship. And we just reviewed them in the morning because we had to change our mind from a woman, from an alcoholic dad who was later abandoned by a person she was the most beautiful woman inside and out I'd ever met and thought she was ugly and could never measure up. And, and I, I did that with her for two years thinking, what a good thing for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that I had covered my insecurities and dysfunctions with just more socially acceptable performance-oriented workaholism that got rewarded. I just want to encourage you, would you go on a journey to come to grips with the real you and learn to love you. Because if you can't love you, according to Jesus, you're to love your neighbor as your self. Lord, thank you so much that you love us for who you made us. Thank you that you bought us and you think we're that valuable. And we want you to know that um, we need grace. We can't do this on our own. Would you give us that measure of faith to see ourselves the way you see us, that we'd be free, free not to impress, free to love, free to be appropriately transparent, and free just to accept others and realize none of us have it all together. We ask you this in the strong name of Jesus.